Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we talk about literature. Today, I am continuing my literary theory series. Wow, that is, that is, I said that right, but it sounded weird. Um, with a discussion of where the meaning in a work comes from. So maybe this question seems a little weird and a little vague, but I promise it will make more sense as we get into it. So in my previous episodes, we have discussed how to ask good questions of a text. We have discussed how to determine right and wrong answers and how to tell the difference between them, how to arrive at a correct answer and avoid the wrong ones. Um, but now we're going to take our examination of giving good answers to a more... A, a deeper and more foundational level than we were previously. So we're working with some foundational assumptions when I did that video, which is necessary to kind of get through figuring out what the right answers are. But now we're actually going to take a step back and analyze where meaning in the work actually comes from in the first place, let alone how to determine whether or not they're right, which is a simpler concept, but this one's more foundational, so it's more complex. Anyway, that's why I did it in that order, but I don't think that actually matters at this time. All right, <laughs> so there are two major sides to this debate, and um, as when anybody breaks down any debate into two major schools of thought or two major sides, the opposition and so forth, it is an oversimplification of the ideas. Um, and we're going to start with this simple breakdown, but do know that the discussion of literary theory as like the philosophical like underpinnings for literary theory, it's a lot more complex than what I'm going to break it down into today. So one side says that the meaning of the work exists in the text and comes from the mind of the author. Now, almost everyone agrees that the, that that can be consciously or unconsciously done by the author, but ultimately the author is the source for that meaning. That means that it could be unintended simply from imbibing ideas, from reading other books, from being exposed to other images and concepts, that the author unconsciously weaves them into the story in the process of writing, and that the reader can you know, consciously pick up what the, un write, what the author has unconsciously put in the text. Um, and as well as what the author has intended to put in the text and the meaning that the author has intended for us to pick up on. Um, but, uh, yeah, so most people agree that it can be both conscious and unconscious meaning inputted, but ultimately the source is the author and the author is the one who put it in there. The opposing viewpoint, so the second choice, is that there's no meaning intrinsic in the work except what the reader brings to the text. In this way, the book is an empty vessel uh, into which the reader pours meaning into the text. Um, another way of thinking about it is that the book is a mirror and it only re reflects back uh, you know, it reflects back something different to each reader. That's why each reader has a different experience with it. And it reflects back uh, only that which the reader has within him or herself. Um, and as you may have guessed from my insistence that the correct answer must be founded on what the book says, that goes along with the idea that the work does have intrinsic meaning, that we are there to read it, to understand it, to learn from it, and to gain something from it that is not intrinsic to us, that is outside of us, to make us... Uh, learn how to be better people. If we're only looking at the book for what we ourselves already know and we're the ones who are putting the meaning back into the book, then what's the point? I might as well sit and think about the things that I already know. That kind of implies that there's nothing to learn from books, um, which I think we all probably disagree with. So let's take a look at some of the major uh, schools or uh, theories of literary criticism. We're going to start parsing them out into these two different categories. Um, and because there's so many, I'm going to do this in two parts. We're going to tackle three or four today. Um, and then in the next episode, we'll tackle the rest and kind of do a wrap up. All right. So the first literary criticism that I want to take a look at is called moral cri criticism. It's also called uh, new criticism. No, we're not there yet. Um, and this started way back with Plato. So this school sort of asks, what is the moral or ethical position of an artistic work? Um, to Plato, merely imitating nature without adding a moral framework or an ethical overlay to the work itself uh, was to fall short of the purpose of art. 
Um, and so I brought up the morality of wives and daughters in my analysis when I discussed how the intellectual characters are favored and advanced, while characters that represent romanticism are show to, shown to be weak and failing. And this is sort of a moral lens that I put on um, in order to examine that issue within the book. Um, and again, because this school of thought is referring to content and the construction of the text itself, it falls in the first category. Um, and it assumes that the meaning is in fact intrinsic to the work. It's not something that the reader is bringing to the table. The second uh, school of literary criticism that I want to talk about is called formalism. Um, this A subcategory of this is also called new criticism. And again, there's uh, a lot of different sort of subcategories in all of these that are more complex. And for a really quick cheat sheet, I actually have a link in the description below for Purdue, from Purdue Owl, which I also referenced when making this video. So formalism. This school of thought teaches that uh, form follows function. Um, I used a formalist argument in Ethan Frome when, uh, in episode one when I talked about how the use of the frame narrative uh, supports and uh, is in line with the function of the introspective purpose of the no novel. In that case, the form, the frame narrative, followed the function, which was its introspection. So formalism also disconnects any work from the context in which it was made. It considers each work as sort of like an island unto itself, constructing within it its own symbols, images, and meanings without reference to anything outside of it or previous work or anything like that. Um, and this school of thought also falls firmly in the first category. Formalism very strongly asserts that the meaning is intrinsic to the work, so much so that it, it rejects anything outside of the work entirely. All right. Now we're going to move into schools of uh, literary criticism that may not be universally applicable because they're dealing with certain um, almost topics. And if those topics aren't dealt with within the novel, then you're not going to see someone writing or dealing with um, that particular issue. Um, so uh, number three is psychoanalytic criticism. And uh, these are building on the ideas of Freud and Jung. Psychoanalytic criticism examines literature for such ideas as archetypes, the monomyth, the super ego, ego id, edible complex, the uncanny and the doppelganger, for example. That was a, a psychoanalytical uh, approach to Ethan Frum that I took in episode two. Um, it was building on those ideas from psychoanalysis. Um, Unlike formalism, it again connects the presence of these ideas to the, the greater context of the human race, um, I, particularly through Jung's idea of the collective unconscious. And again, it tends to assert that these components are often but not always unintentionally included by the author, which means that again, the source of the meaning is within the work itself, through the author and in the book itself, not within the reader. And the fourth school of criticism that I want to take a look at today is Marxist criticism. Um, and this is another school of criticism that may not be universally applicable to all uh, books, but tends to be used when certain ideas are present or brought up in the text. And Marxist criticism deals with the issue of materialism, class differences, and socioeconomic issues. Marxism analyzes how the events and circumstances and characters within the novel are distilled down to issues of economics, property, and wealth, or lack thereof. Um, and which makes sense because, of course, Marxism distilled down the essential problems that we have as a human race and therefore within our government to having property. So this school of thought also belongs to the first category. It depends upon the ideas intrinsic within the text and likewise asserts that these may be consciously or unconsciously included by the author. Okay. So I'm going to stop there for now, um, otherwise I'll be long, rambling for way longer than anyone wants to listen to, and I will continue my overview of literary theories next week, and we will cover everything from structuralism to postmodernism, and when we continue, uh, and we'll continue to put kind of put them into these broad general generalities as we pursue the question: Where does meaning come from? Until next time, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile.